Aradia is ruled over by six vast cultures, with eight major clans ruling all the cities and castles of the land. In Mountain Blade 2, Bannerlord, it is your job to interact with these clans for the main quest. But before you do so, you yourself start out as a minor clan, amongst a smattering of other minor clans across the campaign map. In our video today, we're going to explore those other minor clans and how they can be extremely advantageous to you in not just the early game, but throughout your playthrough as you grow your own kingdom. I'm going to cover the units of each minor clan as they have their own unique unit line, the benefits that they can give you as the player, and where they're located on the map when they aren't part of another kingdom or part of another kingdom's wars. And again, some other tips. So let's dive in on my guide to the minor clans. Before I talk about where they are on the map, I really want to highlight the benefits of attacking these guys and why they should be important to you. Here is Dwayne of the Beni Zalal, and I've just defeated him in combat, shockingly enough. Now, right out of the gate, here is why these guys are so important. They are minor clans, just like you, and as thus, are not aligned with any one faction at the start of the game. This gives you an immediate progression in targets outside of the various bandits that swarm the lands of Colradia. Now you'll be able to attack a higher density of troops with far better loot. In addition, take a look at Dwayne's armor. Uh, he's stacked. This grants you a small chance to get his armor as a drop. As of version 1.2, that armor will more than likely have a modifier like cracked or rusty, greatly reducing the sell price, but still giving you some great armor in the early portions of the game. This extends to the troops as well, who will also have a nice array of gear depending on which minor clan you attack. The lake rats, or I'm sorry, the lake rats, for example, can have tier four or five chainmail halberks, while the oath keepers don't really have the nicest sets of armor, so it's clan dependent. In my experience, the further along you are in your campaign, uh, the more of their loot that they drop. So, uh, for example, day 450 versus day 50. Um, in addition. One other little thing here, um, so rather than take this guy prisoner, I'm going to release him. And that's going to grant me some charm experience. That is another huge benefit of this. So you fought well, you're free to go, and well, there wasn't any uh, huge gain there. You also get some relation, which will help out when it comes to uh, dealing with bringing these guys into your clan. On top of the loot, which we'll show more of in just a second, you're going to get a Grip of Renown, which is really important in the beginning of the game to progress to Clan Tier 2. At this tier, you can become a vassal, and it is the first tier in which you can gain access to fiefs. Progressing to clan tier 3 and being a vassal of a nation will guarantee that the ruler will award you a fief as soon as one is available, if you didn't get it in the previous tier. So there's loot, there's renown, there's experience, uh, there's charm experience, but there's one final benefit, and I'd argue that this is probably the largest one. Prisoners. You can get so many prisoners from attacking the minor clans. If you're trying to level up your roguery, you can turn them into taverns for some quick experience gains. Also, it awards you a further amount of money for ransoming them. If you want more influence, if you're a ruler or a vassal of a kingdom, you can donate the prisoners if you so wish. Or, and this is probably the most important part of the video, and we'll go into it more in the latter portion when we discuss the troops, you can convert them to become a part of your army. And I cannot stress how huge this is because currently it is the only way to acquire many of the minor clan units in the game, such as these guys right here. As you'll discover by the end of this video, they have some of the best troops outside of the noble lines for the respective factions. The Arboreals are some of the best archers. Triarii are amazing heavy infantry. Ghoulman riders are outstanding cavalry. There's just tons of options, and it adds a lot of flavor to your campaign. I mean, for example, I have a Sturgia roguery-focused character that I play. I went on a journey through Asurai to find a companion, but ended up fighting a member of the Jawal and getting 15 or 16 Ghoulman recruits for my army. Uh, it sort of creates this fun narrative of this Sturgian mercenary with troops from Sturgia and a force of deadly shock cav from a distant and mysterious land. I really love how the minor clans can fill in some of the gaps of your armies depending on the cultural playthrough you have in mind. You can see here, uh, I'm a little bit later in the game, so I have a huge amount of uh, prisoners from this one unit, and also I have a lot of his own prisoners to put into my army. But I'm just going to press done here so I can show you, sure it's fine, uh, so I can show you the loot. Because the loot also, um, this, like I was saying, the further you are in the game, uh, the more loot I've noticed that you actually get rewarded 
from that party. And this looks like a little bit more of the tier 5 and 6 stuff that I would have expected less of in the earlier portions of the game. So as you progress through, you'll actually get even more loot from attacking these minor clans. And even further, if I take a look over here at my party menu real fast, once this all loads through, um, I can go down to the bottom of this and you can see I'm already starting to work on recruiting some lake rats and some scolder units, some hastati and some principes. So you can really add a lot of flavor and variety into your army with a lot of the prisoners and troops from the minor clans. So a lot of what I've mentioned is really going to help you out in fighting these minor clans in the beginning of your campaign. But you're probably wondering, how do I find them? Well, you can click on any one of the minor clans by going to the encyclopedia page, going to clans, clicking minor, and let's just select Company of the Golden Boar. Well, I can click on this gentleman here, and then I can click on last scene here, and then press track, and now it's on my map to go and find him. But one thing you should know, if it does say part of, and then there is a banner here, and it will thusly color the banner of that clan, that is a part that, that means that they are part of an actual kingdom and you can't just go attack them unless you're a part of that kingdom as a mercenary or a vassal or you're okay with going to war with all of Batania. So for example here, the Gilman, who uh, Dwayne was a part of, he's not part of any clan. There's nothing right here. Uh, but if I go back to, uh, let's just say, the Force people, I can see that they're part of Asrai and their banner is colored thusly. Uh, a lot of people were asking me about this and I wanted to kind of clarify it before we jump into the geography. Let's go into the geographical locations of the minor clans across Calradia. Now this will only be true for the first 50 or 60 days of your campaign. After that point, they'll join up with another faction or kingdom as a mercenary to help fight in their wars. As of the most recent patch though, they'll constantly be switching depending on which factions need troops the most. So again, please take this with a grain of salt and it's meant more to give you an idea of where to find them in the early portions of the game, uh, kind of to guide you there if, if that's the, the specific factions troops you want to get in the beginning or start of your campaign. Uh, if there's a point in which the clan finds itself not at war or it's captured and then released, it'll more than likely spawn back in its cultural homeland, rebuild its army, then go out and fight again. So I'm gonna break this, break this down by culture as there's typically one to three minor clans per primary culture. Even sometimes it's not even called Sturgeon, they're called Nord or something of the sort. So um, we're gonna pretty much break it up just like that so it's easier to follow. Our first clans are the ones from Volandia, and these make up some great early game targets to expand your army. We've got the Company of the Golden Boar here, uh, comprised of levy troops that have opted to continue warfare rather than returning to their fields as farmers. And as such, they typically make their home in the northern reaches of Volandia, from Ostakin all the way down here to Ox Hall. Now moving further south, the other minor clan is the Brotherhood of the Woods, home of the famous Arboreal Archers. They actually have an interesting lore, starting out as a Robin Hood-esque band of peasants robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. And as their size and notoriety grew, they became just like any other band of bandits and mercenaries, selling their skills to the highest bidder. And you can find them along the southern reaches of Valandia in the mid to southern reaches, I guess you could say, actually. Uh, they actually... Um, I've seen some of them as far north as uh, Talviel Castle, over here even into Inveth, as far west as Jacqueline and Galand, then as far south as Charis, all the way down over here to Gamardan as well. To the east of Valandia lies the forested lands of Batania, home to two more minor clans. Sharing a border with Valandia, there's a bit of an overlap with the Forest People, an interesting Sturgeon and Batanian cultural hybrid known as the Vakan. These people specialize in slash and burn farming, using the ash as fertilizer. Predominantly farmers, they're located in a similar location to the Brotherhood of the Woods, around Talivel Castle, and then down once more to Gamardan. But I'd argue that the key difference is that the forest people will wander more north and eastward into Batanian lands, whereas the Brotherhood of the Wood will wander south and westward into Valandian lands. Secondly is the Wolfskins who are typically noble sons of Batania that take part in an ancient tradition known as wilding. Essentially, they live like wolves, wearing no sewn clothes, eating no cooked meat, and sleeping under no roof. They start out in the center of Batania, all the way up to the northern portions out by Nevyank's castle. In the furthest reaches of the icy northern lands lies the minor clans of the Sturgeons and the Nords. 
The Skuldrabrota, or the uh, Shield Brothers, are an intensely serious mercenary company of Nords out of the Sturgeon heartland. Relying on their extensive training with axe and spear, they are valued across the north by noblemen for their almost monastic approach to warfare and discipline. As you would expect, they spawn right smack dab in the center of Sturgia at Sabir. The Lake Rats, on the other hand, while culturally Sturgian, are found around the Great Lake below Sturgia. They are known for creating false lighthouses that wreck ships on the shoreline for their looting purposes. Uh, their spawn can be a little funky as mine spawn them, you know, down here by Onira. Uh, but they will quickly make their way around the edges of the Great Lake, going to Omar, Varnavapal, uh, down over here to uh, Argaron, to Diathma. They'll pretty much just kind of run in a circle around the giant Great Lake here. In the far east, the Rolling Steps are home to but one minor clan, and that is the Karakurgit. This nomadic clan refuses to centralize with the primary ruling faction of the Khazates, the Urkanid Khans. This allows them to move fluidly through the steppes and sell their sword to whom they wish. You can find them in the beginning portions of the game in the northern regions of the Khazate territory. They will typically spread across the entire Khazate territory, uh, coming down here into uh, the southern empire and over here as well into the uh, northern empire a little bit as well. You'll just kind of find them in this nice big open area. Uh, the Kazate Empire land. Now, in the southern territories, we have three more minor clans of the Asrai and the Darshi cultures. The Jawal, or Romers, are a Bedouin confederacy throughout the Nahas Desert. Much like the Karagurit, they are a nomadic autonomous tribe that has eschewed the forward-thinking ways of the Banu Asra and hold on to the old Asari ways. You'll find them around uh, Kaira, but they'll typically head south to the periphery portions of the Azirian territory. Now, the second minor clan is the Gilman, comprised of a subculture of Azrai and Kazait known as the Darshi, out of the southern and eastern deserts. They are both slave and slave masters, selling themselves to the order while retaining themselves as part owner. Kind of an interesting little uh, dynamic. Their skill with mounted archers is second to none, and their lances rival those of Valandia and the Empire. You can find them in the westernmost portion of the Azrai lands around Sanala. Now, the Beni Zalal is the, is the last minor clan of the Azrai, and not much is known of them outside of being a secret society. This clan is rooted in the central portion of the Azirian lands around Iyakis and Kwasira, but they roam throughout the entire territory as needed. Last but not least are the Imperial Minor Clans, with four minor clans stretching across the massive former empire. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is the Elethero, or Free People. They share a close heritage with Sturgia as former slaves and debtors, but they can be found among the Northern Empire territories or in the frontier of the Sturgian lands. Also, the second clan is the Embers of the Flame, comprised of the religious zealots that wait for the return of Emperor Darussos. In the beginning portions of the campaign, they can be found in the Northern Empire way up here, but will move between Northern and Southern Empire pretty seamlessly. Third, the Hidden Hand is a Mafia-esque minor clan that rules over the rural areas of the Southern and Western portions of the Empire, and their territory is just that, pretty much the Southern portions right when you start. Lastly, my favorite minor clan is the Legion of the Betrayed. They are made up of veterans from the Battle of Pendrake that clung to the old ways of the Imperial Army prior to the personal retinues that we see in the current era. And they make up the majority of the Western Empire with a little bit of the Northern Empire uh, mixed in. The way I'd like to do this next section is reviewing each minor clan's respective troop line. They all get their own very unique and, depending on the clan, a quite strong set of troops. I'm going to give it two grades. The first will be the clan's difficulty when it comes to attacking them on the campaign map. Uh, some clans are far easier to kill than the others, especially in version 1.3, which saw a massive overhaul to the loadouts of each of the clans. The second rating will be its comparison to my best units by troop type video I did linked in the upper right corner. For example, I'll be comparing the infantry of all the minor clans to the Valandian Sergeant or the Heavy Cavalry to the Imperial Cataphracts. Let's take a look at our first unit. So our first faction is going to be the Company of the Golden Boar, and that is the Boar Novice, Boar Veteran, and Boar Champion. 
I'm going to rate these guys as moderate as far as difficulty goes because I think that they actually have a good set of array or a good set of um, armaments. They've got a sword, a shield, and then varying levels of armor as they progress through their ranks. And I think that they're they're relatively easy to come by too in your Valandia campaign. They are a Valandia style um, minor clan, and you can find them for any clan. It doesn't really matter if you're Valandia or not. But I will give these guys their units an excellent rating. Uh, they are the best crossbowmen in the game. The boar champion has 200 one-handed. He's got 120 pull arm, just, which really doesn't matter, but 180 crossbow and 180 or 20 athletics. To compare that to the Valandian sharpshooter here, the Valandian sharpshooter only gets 130 crossbow, and it's the same thing with the empire uh, crossbowman or sergeant crossbowman. So uh, the boar champion is the best crossbowman. Now I will say this though, Crossbowmen are at a weird kind of place in the game. Their crossbows don't do very much damage by comparison to the amount of shots that they can get out. Archers always kind of eke out above them just because they can do more damage over time than, say, a crossbow which is stuck to doing a pretty set amount of damage as per its reload. So I still think that the Fian or the Asrai Archer or the next unit we're about to talk about outrank the Boar Champion until crossbows are fixed a little bit. But as it is, the Boar Champion is still the very best crossbowman in the game. So the other Valandian minor clan is the Brotherhood of the Woods. This is the uh, dreaded Arboreal line. Now, I would rate these guys as easy when it comes to fighting them. They have very low armor. Um, their weapon is, I believe it's just a sword, if not a dagger, depending on which rank they are. And they don't have much armor outside of this. Even the Arboreal line, or the top end, the Arboreal, is very, very low armored. The biggest threat here is the fact that you are dealing with a lot of archers, and that can be punishing. Because the thing about the Arboreal is that it is probably the best archer outside of the Fian. If we take a look at this, 200 one-handed, 200 bow, and 140 and athletics. Ignore the crossbow because it doesn't use that. But I would, again, rate this as an excellent unit. If I take a look at the Fian champion here, we can see that it, the Fian's got 260 bow, and then the Fian itself has 160. So it's got a place in between the two. It's even better than the Asurai Master Archer. So Really take this into account when you're fighting these Arboreals. Anytime you pick up the Forester units, the Sprouts, the Saplings, you're going to want to keep them in your army and convert them all the way down into Arboreals. Arboreals, you can't. They are Tier 5. They will not convert for you. But you should try to grab as many Sprouts and Saplings as you can to get these guys up to their max level. Moving into the Batanian Minor Clans, we have the Wolf Skins with the Young Wolf, Seasoned Wolf, and Chosen Wolf. These guys I would rate as very easy. They have light armor. They still have bows, so you do have to worry about them, but writing them down is quite easy, especially if you have a large contingent of cavalry. And even if you don't, even just having enough footmen or responding archers can kill them quite quickly. They do have shields, so they can protect themselves a little bit, but again, I still find these to be one of the easiest minor clans to attack in the game. That also brings me to discussing their units, which I find to be quite poor. I would rate them among some of the worst ones in the game, to be honest. Taking a look at the Chosen Wolf, which is your tier 5 unit for the wolf skins, 180 uh, bow, one-handed with 140 uh, athletics is okay and all, but their armor is not exceptional. They're not going to last the long haul if you convert them. They might be a really good early unit game just to kind of get something in your army that is relatively inexpensive and easy to acquire since you're going to be killing the wolf skins in droves, but I personally find these guys to be a unit you can absolutely pass on. The other Batanian minor clan are the forest people with the recruit, expert, and veteran foresters. Now, these guys I would also rate as very easy. They are simply archers with a very low amount of armor. Um, they are maybe a little bit harder than your wolf skins because the veteran forester, for example, has a little bit scarier of a stat line, but not enough for me to give them that moderate tag of difficulty. Overall, I would find these units, again, to be pretty lackluster. You get so much more value out of the Arboreal, which has a better uh, set of armor and a little bit better armament than the veteran forester, and you're just more better off, you're better off going with either a noble line or an Asrai Master Archer, even if you don't want to touch the Arboreal. You can use the Foresters if you do want to get some quick, good, or at least solid uh, archers. I just find them, again, another unit to pass up on when it comes to the minor clans and all their unit types. 
Moving over to the Sturgeon Minor Clans, we have the Lake Rats in the Recruits, Veterans, and Wreckers. And I would actually give these guys a pretty decent difficulty rating at moderate. They're essentially like Sea Raiders, but the Veterans and the Wreckers are a bit better because they have a lot better armor and a little bit better armament than your standard Sea Raider. But when it comes to their overall troop viability, they are excellent. The Lake Rat Wrecker is a beast. 160 one-handed, 200 pull-arm, 140 throwings, and 140 athletics. If I were to compare these guys to the Sturgeon Veteran Warriors, they're pretty much better stat line with just a little bit less armor. So I think that if you're playing through a Northern Empire or a Sturgeon playthrough and you get a lot of Skulder or Lake Rat in your area, getting a lot of Lake Rats is going to be huge. The other Sturgeon Minor Clan are the Skulder Brodva, with the Recruits, Warriors, and Veterans. Now I'm going to give these guys an easy rating because of the fact that even though they're very similar to the lake rats, they use throwing axes versus javelins. And in my experience, javelins do far more damage and tend to be a little bit more accurate. Now, as far as their overall recruit viability, I do want to give them that excellent rating. But I'm unfortunately going to have to go with moderate on these guys because they still are a very solid troop choice. But the biggest problem here is if you take a look at the veteran Brotva, he has 182 handed but he has no two-handed weapons. He still has a good pull arm at 150 and throwing and, and athletics at a good considerable amount of uh, skill points. Uh, but the biggest problem is, again, no two-handed weapon. Where these guys really shine is their Skulder Warrior Brotva with 80 pull arm and a really nice set of armor at just tier 3. If we compare this to the Sturgeon at tier 3, he outclasses him armor-wise leaps and bounds. Moving over to the Kazate lands, we've got the Karahurgit with the Karakazate line with the Nomads, Riders, and Elders. Now, these guys I'm actually going to give um, still that moderate level of difficulty with a word of caution. Try not to fight them in a huge quantity or else you'll find this difficulty bump up to hard quite quick. Because you are dealing with a large amount of Archer Cav and they will take you down quick if you cannot deal with them. So moderate to hard is probably what I'm going to give them here. Now, the recruit viability is also, again, quite well. Uh, if you take a look at the Kazate Elder, uh, you're looking at a unit that pretty much sits in between the cons guard and the uh, infantry choice. There's just a non-noble unit choice for the Kazate. And look at this. 100 one-handed, 100 pull arm, 200 bow, and 200 riding. Looking at that compared to the cons guard, just a little bit less than a lot of these stats. Um, of course, the Consguard has a much better pole arm and 60 more bow. But if you're looking to get some really solid archer cav for your unit, for your army, and you can't get the Consguard, getting these guys is going to be a really solid addition and you really are not going to be disappointed. Moving south into the Asrae, we've got the Jawal Recruit, Camel Rider, and Bedouin. Uh, don't mind the weird glitchy uh, icons here for these guys. But I would mark these guys as quite easily. The Recruits are on foot. Very low armor, and it kind of progresses all the way up through the chain, even to the Bedouin, which has very light armor. You can take these guys out quite easily. You do have to worry about their throwing weapons. Um, they do have those, and they have them at a very high skill, even at the very bottom with the Jawal Recruit, having 150 throwing and 250 athletics. And then that scales up here to 200 in the Bedouin. Now, as overall recruits, though, I find these guys to be extremely lackluster. I think that there are way better Astri units across even the Benny Zalwal or in the Gilman, and I think they're totally something you can pass on. The second of the Astri minor clans is the Benny Zalal, with the recruits, soldiers, and royal guard. Now, I find these guys to be easy to moderate depending on how many royal guard are in the army, but honestly, I find them to be so lightly armored that taking them out is quite easy, especially if you have a large amount of archers to really focus them down and shoot them off their horses. Because they are just using throwing weapons, they're not going to be able to take as much out of you as, say, archer cavalry will. Now, as far as their viability goes, I think that they kind of are on the poorer side, again, very similar to the Jawal. Um, the Royal Guard itself just sits simply above a Mameluke Heavy Cavalry, and when I take a look at this, they have 140 throwing, crossbow, polearm, and 160 riding, but if I'm going to get a unit, I'm probably going to get the Mameluke Heavy Cav, because I prefer the bow over the throwing and pretty much lackluster combat skills. Even taking a look at the Ferris, which gets really amazing combat skills, really great throwing weapons, and a really nice set of armor, I think that the Mameluke um, and the Vanguard Ferris just kind of outshine the Royal Guard.
Uh, but I will say though, if you want quick access to cavalry, they're not, it's not it's going to hurt you to put them in your army. I just think that there are better options for an asterized strict playthrough. The last of our Asteri Minor Clans is the Gilman, and I would actually rate these guys as quite difficult to deal with because as soon as they hit their rank 3, they become very formidable. The Coleman is a little bit lightly armored and easier to deal with, but the Gilman and the Gulman are a very strong opponent. So I would very, I'd be very wary of these in the earlier portions of the game, but as your uh, army kind of grows up, you can deal with them a little bit better. Now, as far as the recruit viability... Fitting their difficulty, I think it's quite good. Uh, and this is, again, because they ramp up so quickly. The Gilman is a very strong unit. At rank 3, it has really nice armor, at a tier 5 archer armor, as well as a nice set of barding. But then if I look at the Ghoulman, he has amazing armor as well. He has a camel, which is kind of goofy and fun, but he sits just above the Mameluke archer when it comes to his stat line with 130, 130, and 150. Comparing that, of course, to the heavy Mameluke archer at 130, 130, 130. So they're a little bit faster and they're built more for combat with more pull arm and one handed. So if I wanted a true shock cab unit for the an Asurai style playthrough, the Ghulam really kind of fits that niche. Focusing on the central portion of Calradia here in the Empire, we have the Hidden Hand with the Pawn, Hand, and then Puppeteers. Now, I would mark these guys as easy. I, in fact, they're my preferred minor clan to attack in almost all of my playthroughs. And thusly, when I take a look at the recruit viability, I actually mark it the worst almost of any minor clan. And it's mainly because the Puppeteer, while he does have some pretty nice armor, he's got 180 one-handed, which is cool, 200 throwing, which you would think is great, and 100 athletics. The problem is that he's got throwing daggers, and as of right now, the throwing daggers are extremely lackluster, and he doesn't have a shield. So this unit is a very short-range unit with no real staying power. I think you should absolutely avoid recruiting the, high, the Hidden Hand, but kill them in droves. Another Imperial Minor Clan are the Embers of the Flame with the Oathkeeper recruits, experts, and then veterans. And these guys are also just as easy at the Hidden Hand, if not even easier. Taking a look at these guys, they have absolute terrible armor. They have near nothing on them of real worth. They have just an absurdly high athletics. And these guys just recently got a pass in version 1.2 and 1.3 with better armament to tell you how bad it was before. The recruit viability, again, kind of falls in line with the hidden hand. The veteran Oathkeeper is, in my opinion, garbage. He's got 180 athletics, which is cool, but no other stat is good, which makes me believe that his stats have to be a little skewed or messed up right now. So hopefully in the future, this will become a viable or at least a good unit in some regard. But right now, even his armor is terrible as he progresses through the rank because they keep the same monastic robes that fit in with their uh, zealot kind of lore. But I definitely think you should be passing on the Oath Keepers for recruitment. But again, kill them in droves. The third Imperial Minor Clan is the Elethero, and these guys are quite easy to deal with. They are very lightly armored, and their stat line is not awesome, and they're pretty easy to come by. I found them in almost every portion of the Empire, no matter what I did. So getting up close and personal with these guys, the Hidden Hand, Embers of the Flame, is going to be a great way to increase all of those stat lines we've talked about. Their recruit viability, again, falls right in line here. They are absolutely garbage. They have gotten a pass in 1.2 and 1.3, and they went from being really cool, awesome centerpiece, kind of um, a, a very Sturgeon, Nordic-looking units, to these guys. So they have taken a very huge jump down in quality, and unfortunately, again, I would not recommend you recruiting these at all. Our very last minor clan to talk about is the Legion of the Betrayed. Now, I'd give these guys a moderate difficulty because they still are some very good foot soldiers. They will predominantly have a lot more Hastati than Principes, and those will actually kind of help out in really reducing their durability and making it easier for you to kill them, and also giving you quite a good bit of loot. Now, the recruit viability, though, is through the roof. Taking a look at my video here where I discussed my favorite heavy infantry unit, the Triarii is without a best, the best unit in the game. 200 one-handed, 160 pull arm, 160 throwing, and 100 athletics. Comparing this to an Imperial Legionary, um, it has better all of the stats I just mentioned. Even better armor in my opinion. Comparing the two, it just is a sure fit for that best slot of heavy infantry. These guys are trucks, and you can get them in a really good of vast number by just converting them through Hastati. And Hastati themselves are still very good units. Um, it does say that these guys have throwing, 
And I know that the Prinky Pests do have Javelins on their back, so they still retain their throwing abilities. I believe the Triarii, just like the Legionnaire, has a bug where it does not have Javelins. But I have still seen sometimes it spawns with Javelins. So I think that there is a bit of a bug in there with the Triarii. And I'm giving a little more time here to them because they are just that much more incredible than any other unit in the game when it comes to just strictly heavy infantry. We've talked about the veteran sergeants here uh, with Valandia. And Valandia does have, again, really solid um, units with those um, uh, veteran sergeants. But the veteran sergeant, just the overall viability of it is really great with its shield, with its polearm, with its mace. But it does not have throwing javelins in the way that the Triarii, the Principes, and the Hastati do. And the level of armor it has is even better than that of the sergeant. So I truly believe the Triarii is the best foot soldier in the entire game. Now, the last thing I want to cover before closing this video out is how to recruit these minor clans into your brand new budding kingdom. Well, you discover them just like we've talked about earlier in this video where you find them on the map and talk to them. Uh, take, for example, the Beni Zalal. I can see that they are not part of another clan as far as a mercenary goes. So I can go and recruit them and make them a mercenary. But you can still do this, for example, with the Embers of the Flame who are part of Batania. Karabos here, I can see he is at Omar, which is where I'm at, and I'm going to go talk to him in the keep. So we're going to have a conversation with him, and you've got two different levels of conversation. So when you go to, there's something I'd like to discuss. You've got this first option, which is what you would do for any other noble that is a part of another clan um, outside of the minor clan. So just say talking to a Valandian noble, you would use that line. But you've got this one here. I would like you to serve Valdor, that's the name of my clan, as a mercenary. And then he'll tell you the rate he wants. If you can pay us 320 dinars in exchange for every influence we gain for you. Okay, this is fair. Join us. So they'll end their contract with the Batanians and then immediately join you. So this is how you would recruit them into your clan. So this is a great way to kind of boost up your initial playthrough of your kingdom and trying to make it so that you've got more parties at your disposal. Um, and as you uh, kind of go through your kingdom, here it is, that, that portion, you can see that they are now part of your kingdom in the clans menu there. They're going to be getting all sorts of great benefits as a member of your clan. But hopefully this helps you out in getting more um, men or armies or, or, or parties for your clan. And the one thing that I forgot to mention here is that before you can actually bring anyone into your kingdom as a mercenary, you have to talk to the leader of that minor clan. So... Make sure you're talking to the leader before you go to have this conversation or else they'll say, hey, go talk to our leader. And with that, it brings our video to a close. So hopefully you can really get a good idea of how valuable minor clans are in the beginning portions of your campaign to grow your renown, get some good loot, and hopefully get you some skills or, or experience across charm or roguery. And then in the latter portions of your campaign, when you're working towards building up mercenary contracts for your kingdom or even getting better recruits for your specific armies that are maybe missing certain heavy cav choices or heavy infantry choices. And as you really explore these minor clans, I really encourage you to, to really kind of see how these units will play with your kingdom or how they'll play with your respective parties. Now, a big disclaimer here that they will probably be changed in future patches to come, especially when we look at the Skulders. I'm sure that their polearm and two-handed will be swapped. But if you have any questions about the minor clans and really how to induct them into your playthrough, please let me know in the comments below. I'm always ready to help you guys out and hopefully correct this information in the future as it gets patched. But as always, guys, again, thank you so much for watching here today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below. And if you do subscribe, go ahead and try pressing that little uh, bell button. I'm trying to kind of talk about it a little bit more in my videos because apparently it really helps. But if you don't, no big deal. But again, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.